Good morning. Good morning. So I'm praying for boys because I've been struggling with a little laryngitis. But uh, how many of you want the Lord to have his way in your life? Amen. Now, let me share something with you. That means you're going to let him rearrange your life. It's easy to say, Lord, have your way in my life. There's a whole other thing when he starts to turn things around and change things and say, now, let that go and walk in this. But the good news is, when we do that, we experience an unbelievable freedom. Peace, joy, all the things that the world's looking for. And the love of God will manifest itself in your life. That's the good news. That's when we have joy. So surrender is not always an easy thing. And one thing I've learned about surrendering and yielding my life to Christ is it's kind of a moment by moment, day by day deal. Because uh, I can find myself operating in Danny's way and I feel the Spirit of God going, over here. Am I the only one? So the good news is, is God is patient with us, and He loves us, and He's with us, and He doesn't leave us or forsake us, and He will continue this journey with us to the very end. Man, that's, that gives me great joy. There's just nothing like being in the presence of Jesus. Father, I pray this morning that You would pour out Your Spirit upon us afresh. Lord, we know Your Holy Spirit's here, because Your Word says we're two or three gathered here in the midst, and Lord... So often, it's not about just having the Spirit come, even though you come in fresh ways. As we look at the book of Acts, Lord, many times your Spirit fell and did different and unique things in the body of Christ and in individuals. And Lord, so we invite you to do that in us. We invite you to come and give us a holy revelation of Jesus Christ. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that responds, Lord. Help us to have the heart of Christ and the mind of Christ. Lord, let your word do its work in us today. Let your word grab us and mold us and rearrange us and literally work in our hearts in such a way that we will see the truth and choose it. Lord, would you bind the enemy from this place? Lord, would you encourage the downtrodden? Would you strengthen those who feel weak? Lord, uh, even us who might feel like we're in a good place, would you guard us, protect us from the ways of the enemy, and let us not get tripped up. Lord, speak to us today. We love you and we just invite you in to have your way in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you stand at the door and knock, and that was a message to the church. And if we open the door, you'll come in and eat with us. It's the most intimate thing, Lord, in Asian culture. And we just want to eat with you today, Lord. We want to dine with you. We want to have that fellowship with you. So open our hearts, each one. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now we've been in a series in the Gospels and really looking at our Rabbi Jesus, our teacher, our Lord, our Master. And last week we spent some time in the Gospel of John looking at some I am statements. And one of them that I just love in John 8 talks about where they were challenging him, the religious were challenging him. And Jesus said, Abraham desired to see my day and he saw it. And they were like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, uh, you're not yet 50 years old. I, I'm thinking you're not yet how many hundreds of years old? <clears throat> but uh, Jesus states that he saw it, but he goes on to say, before Abraham, I am. And if you remember in Exodus chapter 3, we looked at that. And in that whole passage where Moses was standing on the holy ground in a bush that wouldn't get consumed by fire, and God spoke to Moses and said, I am sent you. Tell him that I am sent you. And Jesus was saying, that was me. You know, so wake up. I am the Messiah. And I'm the incarnate Word of God on earth. I am the one who's come. And we're going to continue in our storyline of looking at how Jesus just did life. And we were, before that, looking at the 12 apostles that were sent out. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest, because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, and then he sent them. And I just love that, that he was telling them to pray about it. But by the way, you're going. In Luke chapter 10, it says he sent 72 others. And he gave them the same word, he gave them the same authority, he gave them the same instructions. They all cast out demons, they all healed the sick. And they were to come and to share that the kingdom of God is near. And Jesus literally at that point begins to go into those cities where they've gone before him and proclaim the kingdom. But 
he is the Messiah, the, I'm the Savior of the world. And so they were doing this work, and I wanted to go back into Luke and look at what happened when they came back. And it, so one of my experiences through the years is as God has sent me to different places like Cambodia or Haiti or South America, and different times that I've got to visit different countries. And every time I've gone, I might have gone for one reason, but I tend to end up preaching the gospel. I don't know how God works that out, but almost every time I went as a nurse, I preached five times. Preached in the largest church in Haiti twice, which was 5,000 people. Saw God do unbelievable miracles. I saw many people get delivered from demons, many people healed. Uh, the miracle stuff that you read about in the book of Acts, and, and I didn't go there with any idea that I was going to be a part of this. I went there with the idea that I was going to serve Dr. Angel Martin, and then Morgan, who's an anesthesiologist, and I played nurse in the stuff they needed. I'd no more get in there, and if they heard that a pastor was there, they'd come and find me and drag me off to some place I never saw or knew, scared kind of a little bit inside, and being asked, do you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? And I'd say, yes, I do. And they'd say, good, you need it. <laughs> and I'd pray harder. Because I realized, man, I'm in so far above my head. I need God to show up. But God showed up every time. When I was in Cambodia, God did amazing miracles and works and healings and deliverance. And people were set free from bondages. And I share that because you can come back from that. And I want you to see what happens when they come back. Because this is the response. You come back with a big old smile on your face and go, man, God's awesome. This is amazing. I've never seen God work. And I've seen God do it in America. And I've been a part of it in America. And I've seen God move. Maybe the greatest miracle of all is how many people have gotten saved over the years. And the way God has moved and the gospel has been poured out. And, you know, as in Newton, saw over 1,800 people come to faith in Christ. And we have baptismal services of 60, 70 people getting baptized. All those kind of things. Now, you can't make that happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying I have a formula. I didn't have a formula. I have Jesus. Right? And I love Jesus, and I honor him, and I want people to know Jesus. But what I'm telling you is when he sends you out, when he actually calls you to go somewhere, one of the things we've been talking about, you'll never experience the authority and the power of God unless you actually go when he tells you to go. And you'll be going, well, I've never had any of those experiences. Well, you've never been in a place where you needed them. You know what I'm saying? You understand? So when you feel God stirring your heart to go talk to someone or share with someone, what I want to encourage you with is if you will actually step out and go, then guess what's going to happen? The power and authority of his kingdom is going to be with you. That's the promise. Isn't that what he said in Matthew 28, 17 and following? And it says that Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. And in these passages we've been studying lately, he said he, said, he gave them his authority and power to go. Do what? Do what he does. Touch people. Love people. Set people free from the enemy's grasp. That's the power of God. That's, that's when it's fun. You know, when you're working in the kingdom, you know, just going to church and having church. and Yeah, it's nice. But tell me, if you would go out today and God called you to do something, and he showed up in power, you wouldn't be different. Can I just encourage you? I am no one special. I'm Danny Hodges, I'm raised in a blue-collar home, who never thought he'd go anywhere past Newton, Iowa, who got to sin all over the world. And I, I believe I still have other places to go, right? Where I'll go on mission trips and do things. But just understand, when God calls you to do something, he will give you what you need to do it. So here, here we go. The 72 come back, and I wanted to look at this. Because didn't you expect the apostles to go out and have power and authority? I mean, that's what we say. Well, that was then, you know. They had it. And the only reason I share the stories about what's happened in my life, I just want you to know, God used the guys who had no education to begin with, and God took me to school and did all these crazy things, my wife and I, provided me miraculous ways, and showed up in every area where he's called us. And we've been through hell and high water. Don't misunderstand. We know what the battle is. We know what being rejected is. We know... What being mocked is, we know everything you can imagine. We've been through so many things. I've been shot at. I've been trying to be beat up for my faith. I've had all these kind of crazy things happen in my life. Because it's what the truth. And Jesus says that they hated me. You know what? Hate you too if you serve me. 
and less are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. You know, and we, can I just say I don't like being persecuted? Is that okay to say? <laughs> I didn't like it. And it just about crushed me several times. Because it usually comes from where you don't think it's going to come. Do you understand that? It never comes from where you think it's going to come. It comes from an angle, from a way, from a person you never expect. It hurts a lot more. Do you think Jesus hurt when Judas betrayed him? Because he loved you. And you betrayed him with a kiss. So I just want you to know that those kind of things happen. And in the kingdom, these 72 were coming back and they had been given the authority and power of Jesus would go out in Jesus' name. But listen to what it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 following. It says this, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Isn't that awesome? In your name. They never experienced anything like it. I know completely what they're talking about. And I always had great joy because what always moved me every time God would deliver someone who was demonized or demon possessed or there was a stronghold in somebody's life. When they were delivered and healed, I always walked away with a great big smile from ear to ear. Not because, wow, look at me. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with God. I can't believe with the ocean of people on the world that on this day, at this time, you sovereignly chose to use this guy who's weak to help this guy in Jesus' name get free. It's just being willing. It's being willing. And every time the voice said, Lord, would you use me? Would you use me? Even this week, I was praying, God, I'd like a divine appointment. I had one in the gym. God moved powerfully with a guy that I had major confrontation with a little over a year ago in the gym because he didn't want to believe in God. And now he's talking all about Jesus. And it's just taking time. And I didn't give up on the guy and I didn't back down. In love, I stood for Jesus and kept talking to him. And I love what I see happening in this man's life. He's a miracle. He's 80 years old. Do you realize how hard-hearted he was? To attack, literally came over and attack. And God is moving in his life and setting him free. That's a miracle. Only Jesus can do that. But he uses us. It goes on in here, they return with joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's a pretty good deal. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. And one of the things I want you to know is, is when you're on mission that this stuff applies. It doesn't mean we won't get sick. It doesn't mean we won't get put to death for faith. It doesn't mean all these kind of things. But when we're on mission, God is going to use us for his glory. And I had a missionary that I heard that stepped on one of those real dangerous scorpions that stung me right in the hill. And he went on and went and prayed and never had one single thing happen to him. When God's got you on mission, <coughs> don't go to a snake charmer church, though, please. <laughs> We play with bad snakes. And we milk them. We don't tell you that. But we milk them and they bite us. And we might not die. Dumbest thing I've ever heard of. He's not asking you to go out and tempt faith. He's saying if you're on mission and something happens like Paul did in Acts, right? And the serpent bit him. And that viper that bit him is the kind of viper that you die within a minute. And all the villagers were watching and waiting for him to go and fall over. You know, die. And he didn't. He shook it off in the fire and he kept going about the way and was like, we need to hear about this Jesus that he's talking about. The gospel went out with power. God has a reason that he does these kind of things. Don't go out and tempt faith, though. If you do, you will die within a minute. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a funny story just because it kind of happened to me when I was in Cambodia. They have all, every kind of weird, horrible venomous snake, you know, they have this thing called viper. That was a big thing they told us to be very careful because if you get bit, we won't be able to get you to anything fast enough before you're dead. So, unfortunately, I had to, excuse me, use the restroom. There's no bathroom, you understand. I'm out in the middle of a village in a jungle. 
So I pray and all the time, oh God. <laughs> no what? One of those stupid little vipers that looks like a spit bite me. Because you can't tell the difference when they're just sitting there. And I don't mean to be explicit, but I was going to the bathroom. And one of those critters went right between my legs. Can I just say everything stopped? <laughs> I didn't have to go to the bathroom anymore. <laughs> and I was scared to death for just a second. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and as soon as it moved on, I moved on, and I didn't ever do that again. <laughs> but excited, I would hold it. But what I'm trying to tell you, I believe that thing would have bit me, God would have saved me, because I was on mission. I'm so glad you didn't bite me. Glad I didn't have to find out. But it's interesting, you go to these places, and I believe when you go in God's strength and go in His power, He shows up, and He protects, and He watches over you. And so, this is going on, and He says you'll be able to do these kind of things. You know why? Because the kingdom of God has come, and the great light has gone, and Galilee of the Gentiles, because the kingdom has come, the King is present, the great I Am is there, and He is moving out in power and glory, and it's not just for Him, but He anoints His people and I'm so glad he sent the 72 others. Because if he wouldn't have done that, we would have thought, that was for them, not for us. But again, the reason they experienced it, they went. They did what he called them to do. So in here, it goes on and says, Behold, I have given you authority. And he went through all that. And it says, verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven in the book of life, right? Whew, you know, here's the deal. And I, I got a lot I want to teach on this whole thing here. So I got to not get too carried away here. But I've been around a lot of people for a lot of years who get caught up with, in the culture of uh, casting out demons or doing those kind of things. And their whole world gets consumed with seeing Satan everywhere and under every bush and every kind of thing. And, can I just say that that's never been what God called us to? Our focus is always supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. God wants you or me to deal with that. I don't hang the shingle out saying, I deal with the demonic. No, I don't deal with the demonic. Jesus does, and once in a while, he puts me in the path of somebody that needs to be set free. There's a big difference. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Don't rejoice in that. That's just... Really, the result of you being in me, I will use you to help others get free from the grasp of the enemy, right? Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice that you know me. Rejoice that you've been set free. Rejoice that your sins are forgiven. Rejoice in the right place. And when you do that, you're in a blessable position where God can use you. Because there's people all through the land that get caught up in the wrong thing. They get caught up in miracles. They get caught up in the latest faith healer that they've heard about and want to go see him. They start chasing God all over the place like he's in some specific place instead of realizing he's right here. It's all about you being right with God, you giving your heart to God, you going out in his authority and doing his work. Now, God has used all these different people at different times, but too often we get caught up in the wrong thing. Be caught up in Jesus. People get caught up in the spiritual gifts. Many, many, many years ago, I got on my face and God, I said, God, I don't care. I just want you. Jesus, I just want more of you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to love and honor you with my life. And you want to show up and use me do whatever you want. You know what? That's way more fun than how many churches have you been in people are taking spiritual gift tests. Why? I don't want to do this. <laughs> then I have an excuse not to serve. Like, God's not my gift. It's like, serve. Let God use you. Back, he made service the greatest part of the whole thing, didn't he? Son of man didn't come to be to serve, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Girded himself with a, a towel and washed the disciples' feet. Why? Because that was spiritual? No, because he's shown them, if I, your Lord, your Rabbi, your teacher, your Savior, will get down and wash your feet. What should you do for one another? The greatest of you be the servant of all. God's called us to an unbelievable ministry. But I want to go back to a place in this 
where it says in verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And you know, it's easy to get caught up in what Jesus is talking about here, the authority and the power that you experience and feel, and you can start thinking, I mean, I've had people that begin to think they can rebuke and find everything. You know, I rebuke you, Satan, for this and that. I rebuke the rebellion in that person. I'm like, really? I mean, if it was that easy, you wouldn't have anything going on in the world because we'd already had him tied up and thrown in jail, right? It's not that easy. There's a difference between praying for kids who have rebellion in their heart and rebuking the spirit of rebellion in their heart. The only way that rebellion is ever getting out of their heart is if they repent and give their life to Jesus. Be praying for their soul. Be praying for them to get saved, for their heart to be open to Jesus. And that makes all the difference. But I love this because it says, and this is really encouraging where we're going, but it says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. We're going to be moving around a little bit. Starting in verse 12. Listen to what it says. And this is dealing with the fall of our enemy, the devil. It says, in verse 12 of chapter 14, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend in heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And then it says that you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. And it's dealing with the, the enemy of our soul, Lucifer, the light bearer, would be his name. And in the beginning, there's lots of passages that deal with him that talk about him being literally the guardian of Eden in the beginning. Isn't that something? He was an archangel. <laughs> and he got full of himself and tried to ascend above God as we know. But I want you to see some things. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verses 8 through 11. Something I want you to know is that this didn't just happen. God knew when he made Lucifer the light bearer that he would have pride and that he would become what he has become. In the midst of all that, I don't understand the mystery completely, but I do know this, that if he didn't have a choice, he wouldn't have free will. And if he didn't have a choice, there would be no right for judgment. But we have choice, and God wants us to serve him because we love him. He wants to use us in a powerful way. But as we look at this, Revelation chapter 12, verses 8 through 11, listen to what it says. It says, But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. It says then, and you'll see why. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. So we know what he's about. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has, have come for the accuser of our brothers, and I love this, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. So he's been thrown down, and it literally happens because Jesus was crucified and defeats the principalities, right? and was raised from the dead. But he's thrown down, so he's no longer allowed to do what? Stand before God day and night and accuse us. That's pretty cool. It goes on in verse 11, they have conquered him by what? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives, even unto death. Meaning no matter what he's doing, no matter how powerful he seems, we know that we know that Jesus Christ is the King. And that Jesus, through his death and burial and resurrection, has conquered not just the grave, not just our sins, the penalty for our sin, but he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law on your behalf and mine. What does that do? It takes the right of the enemy away to accuse us. You can't. 
That's pretty cool. We've overcome him by what? The blood of the Lamb. Can we say that? We overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's a powerful thing. Do it one more time. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So then, let's keep looking here because I love this Matthew 16, 18. means a whole lot more when you begin to understand it in that context. But 16, 18 says this. And he was talking to Peter, who says, on this rock, Peter, I'm going to build my church. And so Peter's not here anymore, is he? Who do you think that message is to now? It's to you and me. To us. Right? And he goes on and says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, I have a revelation. I, I shared this before, but I know I have. But I just want you to know I had a time in my life where I knew God loved me. I knew my sins were forgiven, but I felt defeated. Anybody else ever feel that? You ever been there? Okay? Well, I cleaned an art center at 4 o'clock in the morning before I went to college. This is clear back in my college days when I was going to school to become a pastor. And and I woke up one morning with a song in my heart, and that's four in the morning, and I'm driving over to clean the art center, and, and I get up on a, the floor up there, and, and the Spirit of God just came all over me. I'm by myself, so there's no show in any of this. I begin to dance before the Lord. Now, I don't dance very well. I'm two left feet, right? But God spoke to me that day in a powerful way. And he told me, he says, Danny, the gates of hell won't prevail against you. What? It literally came first. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I said, Lord, I know that. He says, Danny, you are my church. It won't prevail against you either. Don't you understand? It's finished. Quit beating yourself up. Quit falling out your ugly stick. I did it all so that you could be free. I did it all so you could run into my presence. I did it all so you'd understand the grace and the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. I did it for you, and I did it for all who call upon the name of the Lord. And I just love this when you, the gates of Hades will not prevail against you. You know that. You know it in your heart because I know we fight it all the time because, see, this accuser hasn't been thrown in like a fire yet. You might not be able to stand before God and accuse me night and day, but he sure comes and approaches my ears. How about you? You ever feel condemned in your heart because of a behavior or horrible thoughts or can't believe I just feel the way I feel and the enemy attacks that, works within your flesh and tries to make you feel defeated and condemned, and it's a lie. It's the biggest lie from the pit of hell that we've ever heard. He still comes to accuse us. He still comes and speaks his lie. And you know what? So many of us sow that seed right back into our heart. We'll say it in our mouth. I'm not worthy. Well, duh. If you were worthy, Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross. But you're worthy now because you've been sprinkled by the blood of Christ. You've given your life to Jesus. You've been born again of the Spirit. It, your slate has been wiped clean. Not just your past sins, but your present sins, and your future sins. Does that mean that you don't talk to him about what you're going through? Absolutely not. You're in a relationship. I don't just take it for granted, like so many people do in marriage, right? I don't take it for granted. I talk to him about what I'm going through. I share with what I'm struggling with. And I talk to the Lord about, man, Lord, this flesh seems strong. Help me. Through the power of the Spirit, to put it to death. It's no longer me trying to muster it up. It's realizing that surrender, that sweet surrender, turning to Jesus, allowing the Spirit of God to come in, allowing Him to clean the house, allowing Him to rearrange the house, allowing Him to renew my mind. Because without that, I'm going to do the same thing. Right? But Jesus comes. He promises that He will renew our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. He will restore us. He's trying to make us fully who he created us to be. And I just love this. But you know, one more passage I want to turn to Colossians chapter 2. So Colossians chapter 2, Ephesians, Galatians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. We'll get there. 
Colossians chapter 2. And it's going to be verses 9 through 15. I wanted to end with this because it's so encouraging. It is so encouraging. If you understand what the word actually says, the promises for you and for me. Listen to what it says. We're going to start in verse 9 of chapter 2 of Colossians. It says, For in him, talking about Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and he's died in the flesh. Okay? And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. That means there's no one, no principality, no power. The devil, no one, who's above him. Amen. Verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Meaning, that flesh has no power to condemn or control or rule you anymore. Doesn't mean it's gone. I don't know about you, but my flesh pops up every once in a while. And i got to recognize it. And I gotta say no. Okay? Now I'm not perfect at that. Anybody else? So it's a journey. Listen to what it says. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, what you have to understand there is he's literally talking about that you've been buried with him in his death, in baptism, right? So baptism has a really powerful meaning. It means that you've been buried with Christ. You've been literally in his death. And why is that important? Because the, in Romans, it talks about how you get up from underneath the law. Because the law says you're guilty. There's no mercy in the law. It just points out your sin, right? It's a schoolmaster that leads you to Christ. But the only way out from underneath that first covenant is that we've been born again of the Spirit and we've Baptism represents your death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Your radical identification with Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. The Christ lives in me. The life I live in this flesh, I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. So that's what is so powerful. He says in verse 13, And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Do you understand that? We're completely separated before you come to Christ. It says, God made, a, made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. You should be dancing. All our trespasses are forgiven. All. And it says, by canceling the record of debt. Anybody glad that that record is canceled? There's a library in heaven with your name on it. Everything you've ever thought did and not did is in there. That's what's been canceled. Anybody happy about that? Yes. I don't want the other books to be open. I want the book of life to be open, as it says in Revelation 20, 11, and following. And it says, if your name's not written in the book of life, guess what happens? All the books are open, and you'll get an account for your whole life. But if here, if you're in Christ, it tells us that by counseling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside. Nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. Is God good? And it goes on. When he, listen to what it says. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them by his death. He triumphed over them for us. Now in Ephesians it says... You've been raised with Christ and seated with him far above. All rule, authority, power, and dominion. So I'm saying this. Quit acting like you don't have any faith or strength. Do you understand the authority of Jesus is with you when you go? Quit letting the enemy accuse you and make you feel like you're nothing but a worm in God's kingdom. Because it's not true. You're a saint who makes mistakes, who sins, right? Who needs still continued forgiveness. But the deal is, it's done. Get up, walk out your faith, proclaim Jesus, love people into the kingdom. God forgives everyone who calls on his name. Do you understand that? Would you stand with me as we close this morning?
He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. You understand who you are. You're a child of God. The same Holy Spirit lives in you that lives in me, that lived in Paul, that lived in Peter. The same Holy Spirit will give you what you need if you step out and trust Him. But again, man, God moves your heart to go talk to somebody. Go in His strength and His name. Watch what He'll do. He can heal every infirmity. He can heal every disease. Now, He doesn't always do that on our side, right? But He can heal every relationship. He can heal every relationship. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in His authority. In His name. His name is Jesus. For His glory. For His honor. For His reward. Lord, it's for Your glory that we leave this place and become a church. <coughs> Mission Royale and beyond. Have Your way in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Amen.